Hello again. We've talked a little bit about strain gauges in the past. This is the third in a series of videos about how to use strain gauges. Now, I've told you a little bit about how to calculate resistance in a wire and how to uh, change in length, uh, strain on a strain gauge gives you a change in resistance. But that still doesn't get us to the point where we actually do something with the strain gauges. So that's what we're going to do here. All right? I've got my little notional strain gauge here, and that's a, basically a wire that's been wadded up and stuck on this little uh, plastic uh, substrate. And when, this, when I put this on a part and I stretch this, that wire gets longer. When the wire gets longer, the resistance goes up. So that's the beginnings of our gauge system. And the thing we've done, we learned in the last video, was there's this really handy expression okay, called gauge factor. That's K is gauge factor, and it's almost always near 2. Um, in, in general, I'm going to just call it 2. It's typical to see 2.05, 2.1, something like that. All right, change in resistance over resistance. String gauge resistances are always either 120 or 350. I've never seen anything else. Um, maybe there is, but it'd be pretty rare. And change in length over length. Well, change in length over length is strain, isn't it? So let's do this. That's the same thing. Now, let's, for say here, I want to figure out what the change in resistance of a strain gauge is, okay? I can say that, uh, let's see, change in resistance equals K R epsilon. I just multiply through some stuff there. K is always about 2, so let's call that 2. R is 120 ohms, and I've got to pick a strain. Well, let's pick 250 micro strains, say. So that's 250 times 10 to the minus 6. All right? Now remember, strain is unitless. It's in millimeters per millimeters, or inch per inch, or light years per light year. It doesn't matter. Okay? So these are all pretty typical numbers. When I multiply those out, I get 0.06 ohms. Now there's two problems with this. Number one, it's really small. I'm trying to measure six hundredths of an ohm change over 120 ohms, okay? So that's a very, very small percentage. But there's an even a more fundamental problem. The fundamental problem is that my data acquisition systems don't know how to measure resistance. They only know how to measure voltage. If you want an example of a data acquisition system, look at the microphone input on your computer. That's a data acquisition system. You take sound, pre uh, pressure waves in the air, turn them into a voltage, it goes through that little wire, plugs into that little, what is it, three and a half millimeter or so uh, uh, plug on the front of your computer, mine's right over there, and you can record, okay, take something you want to know, pressure waves in the air, and turns it into a voltage, that's what a sensor does. Resistance, it doesn't know what to do with resistance, so we've got to somehow turn a change in resistance into a change in voltage, so let's do that. We're going to do that using this really nifty circuit, and it's called a Wheatstone Bridge, named after a guy named Wheatstone, I suppose. Um, now, it sounds like it might be very difficult. It's not. It's four resistors. And this is what a Wheatstone Bridge looks like, okay? There's a resistor on this corner, and it basically makes a diamond. Okay, that's a Wheatstone bridge, sort of. It doesn't have any voltage going into it or out of it yet, but it will in a second. Now, I'm going to very creatively call that R1, R2, R3, and R4. Okay? And let me try that one more time. Okay, R4. So we got that. Now, we have to have some power going into it. So we're going to have voltage going in. Okay, and that's V in. And I need to get a signal out of it. So let's do that. Let's move this over. Okay, input voltage, and that can be batteries or an electronic power supply or something. V out, that could be your data acquisition system. It could be a uh, oscilloscope. It could be just a voltmeter. But somehow you're going to measure the, the, the change in the voltage potential across those two leads right there. Now, it's the simplest strain gauge circuit is to make R1 your gauge. Okay, now there's four resistors there. Any of them could be your gauge. Um, this is not too surprisingly called a quarter bridge. Okay, that's our strain gauge right there. Oops. Okay, and it's called a quarter bridge because one quarter of your resistors are strain gauges. Makes sense. There's also a half bridge and a full bridge. Now, I haven't seen a three-quarter bridge, but I suppose you could make one. 
All right, so here's what we've got now. The nice part about this is that right there, that bottom half of that circuit, is a voltage divider, and so is that. Now, if you haven't seen a voltage divider before, this is what you typically see in the, the books. Okay, now I was trained as an aerospace engineer. Before I started doing this, I didn't know anything about electricity. So if it's new to you, that's fine. It was certainly new to me. And let's call that R1 and R2. So what, there's a rule that says that the voltage around a loop has to be zero. Well, the voltage in has to be dissipated over both of those resistors. Okay, so the, the, the loop there sums to zero. Well, if R1 and R2 are the same, that means you drop half the voltage across each resistor. And right there, you get half the voltage you had there. So this is 12 volts. That's going to be 6. That's a voltage divider. All right, now I'll leave that up there. You can see that's a voltage divider because input voltage, input voltage right there and there, two resistors in the middle there and there, and a tap in the center right there. That's a voltage divider. So if let's say for right now that all four of our resistors are the same. They're all 120 ohms before I apply any strains. Well, that means that the voltage across there will be half the input, and the voltage there will be half the input. That means the voltage potential across those two is zero. These are both the same with respect to ground, so the difference between them is zero. All right, no problem. Okay, let's, for now, let's just say we're going to use 12 volts here. And you can use anything you want, but let's call it 12 just because that's it's easy to make that with batteries, I guess. All right, so right now, that's got zero voltage if all our resistances are the same. And we're going to say for right now they are. Okay, 120 ohms. That's not the only way to get zero voltage. Anytime you have zero voltage with zero strain, you, you have uh, what's called a balanced bridge. Okay, and This is important. You want to be able to measure small changes in voltage, but you don't want to have to measure them superimposed or some, over some really big DC voltage or you're going to use all the headroom you've got in your data acquisition system trying to resolve the DC part and you won't have anything left for that little tiny change that you're trying to see superimposed over it. So we want voltage out to be zero if there's no strain. So we only care about the, the uh, changing part of it. And we'll do that here in a second. Um, there's an expression that describes the output voltage. And we have V out equals R1, R3 minus R2, R4 over R1 plus R2, R3 plus R4 times voltage in. That's the expression for the output of that circuit. Well, if the numerator is zero, that means if R, the product of R1, R3 equals R2, R4, then it doesn't matter what else is going on, I'm going to get zero in the numerator and the voltage out is zero. Right? So if R1, R3 equals R2, R4, I've got a balanced bridge. And an easy way to do that is just to just, just say this right here, they're all the same. So let's say I know that my change in resistance is, is 0.06 ohms, as we said before, so that R1 prime maybe equals R1 plus DR1. So that DR1 coming from the strain, okay, that's the strain gauge doing its job and I get 120.06. Alright, if you plug all these numbers into there and multiply it out, you get a V out equals um, 1.5 millivolts. Alright, now that's not a lot, but assuming it's not superimposed over something else, that's not that hard to measure. It's easy to put an amplifier or something on it. So, what I've got now, and by the way, this assumes 12 volts input, right, just in case you're, you're checking this yourself. So what I've got right now is I've got, go, let's go back over it. I've got a strain gauge here, right, whose resistance changes as strain changes. Okay, I stretch the gauge or compress the gauge, I get a change in resistance. And it could be positive or negative, doesn't matter. Either one works. The math works both ways. The problem is I don't know how to measure changes in resistance. I need to measure changes in voltage. So I may put this right there, okay? I'm going to put it right there in the circuit. And this circuit allows me to, to turn a change in resistance into a change in voltage. And better yet, if I set the uh, resistances correctly, either there or by using that, I can set it so that the output voltage is zero when the strain is zero. 
right? So that's a strain gauge. That's a circuit. It's called a bridge circuit. 